Bishop Henrikin came to Rhode Island, he was an Irish immigrant, actually. Bishop Henrikin was asked by the Bishop of Hartford uh, to come to the United States to minister uh, as a priest. He originally wanted to be a missionary to Asia uh, and was convinced after a meeting with the Bishop from Hartford that America was indeed a missionary country. And so he was open to the Holy Spirit and actually changed his course. He ended up coming here as a priest and settled in, uh, in Hartford, Connecticut, and was ordained for, for the Hartford Archdiocese. One of the greatest stories about Father Hendrickin's life is his voyage from Ireland to America. Remember, he would have come over on a ship. Uh, on, there were no planes back then for passengers. And on the ship, there was a condition that was put on him because of the anti-Catholic sentiment of, of the day. He wasn't allowed to wear his priestly cassock, his robes, nor was he allowed to function publicly as a priest, which was common in that time in, in this part of the world. So he had these rules to follow, and he got word when he was in his cabin one day that there was a woman also from Ireland in Steerage, the poorest section of the ship, that was dying, and she requested a priest and wanted what's called viaticum, or the last rites. Uh, Father Hendrickin immediately uh, put on his priest clothes and took his viaticum, the things that he needed to, to share the sacrament with the woman, and went without any hesitation to her cabin and to see her, and he gave her last rites, uh, the graces of the sacrament of the sick. Um, it infuriated the ship's captain, and the ship's captain had his crew turn on Father Hendrickin and literally beat him, and he was beaten to the point of being unconscious. He actually lost consciousness on the deck. And there was a man by the name of Samuel Davies, who ended up emigrating and living in Illinois, who interceded. He was a Lutheran, and him and some other Protestants interceded to save Hendrickin's life. And without their intervention, uh, we wouldn't even be speaking about this man today, nor would he be the first bishop of Providence. Hendrickin's heart is revealed, I think his priestly heart is revealed in that act with his heroic charity where he just responded to the person's need and literally put his own needs a second without hesitation, obviously we're certain. Um, there's been documentation done and people gave sworn testimony shortly after his death of this particular week, what's called the incident at sea. Uh, it's an incident of great love. It's an incident of him being willing to suffer for the gospel. Uh, he was definitely uh, had an incredibly the heart of Christ. Uh, and was willing to even physically suffer for that. At the time that Bishop Henrikin came to the United States, he was ordained a priest for the Diocese of Hartford, which actually encompassed the state of Rhode Island, what is now the Diocese of Providence. So when he came here and went to Waterbury, Connecticut, in the New Haven area to minister, it was all one big diocese with very, very few Catholics actually at that time. But he had his missionary spirit. He was willing to change his plans, if you will, to answer God's call, and came here and had a very, very successful uh, pastoral ministry in Connecticut. While he was there in Connecticut, as a matter of fact, the Father Michael McGivney, who's the founder of the Knights of Columbus and is on the road to sainthood, uh, Father Tom Henrikin was his pastor at his parish in Connecticut and inspired him to the priesthood. Uh, one of his greatest influences in his life was Father Henrikin's own priesthood. And there is a story told that uh, Father Henrikin even took Michael McGivney, who would now be Father Michael McGivney and almost Saint Michael McGivney, to Quebec, Canada by train to uh, seminary studies. So Father Tom Henrikin, I think, the reports are that he inspired uh, approximately about 13 or 14 members of his parish to pursue a priestly vocation, so he is also a, a great promoter of priestly life and vocations in the church. So Father Thomas Hendrickin was serving in Connecticut, and Pope Pius IX at the time, uh, more and more Catholics were living in the Providence area. Remember, the Diocese of Hartford would have encompassed Cape Cod, Massachusetts, all of the state of Rhode Island, and Connecticut. And the numbers of Catholics begin to increase, and Providence even had more Catholics living in it than Hartford did. Uh, so what happened was that uh, Bishop Riley and Hartford petitioned Pope Pius IX to form the Diocese of Providence. And of course, every bishop, every diocese rather, needs its own bishop. So Bishop uh, Hendrickin, Father Tom Hendrickin, became Bishop Hendrickin and was consecrated a bishop in 1872. Um, when, he, when that happened, it was a whole different life uh, at that time, the Diocese of Providence consisted of Cape Cod and all of the state of Rhode Island. Later on, the Fall River Diocese would break away from Providence. So Bishop Hendrickin had all of Cape Cod, Nantucket, and all of the state of Rhode Island, and the church um, was growing by leaps and bounds because there were so many immigrants coming in, and the Catholic population, although very discriminated against, was growing at a very, very quick rate. One of the greatest testimonies that we have physically in the diocese to Bishop Thomas Hendrickin's life and his service is our cathedral itself. Uh, that, too, provides us a backdrop, not only for the life of the history of our diocese, but of Bishop Hendrickin's priesthood, his Episcopal service. One of the dreams that he had was to erect an appropriate cathedral for the new diocese. And he worked tirelessly. He went around to parishes and collected the money himself. Whenever he had confirmation, 
he would uh, often have a collection for the sake of the cathedral. Uh, there's tremendous records in the archives of the diocese where we see all, he kept, literally kept track of everything that people gave and people did. It was really one of the greatest goals of his episcopate was to have this cathedral built. Remember, this is horse and carriage days, days of tough weather. Bishop Henriken was very ill. He was a terrible asthmatic and was often sick. And even the last six years of his life was always ill and never had a full night's sleep. Um, we know for certain all the bishops and his friends have written that he never slept one entire night the last six years he was the Bishop of Providence. Nevertheless, with all his maladies and all his illness, he went around the whole diocese and, and raised the funds and met with the architects and commissioned our cathedral. What we're blessed to still have in the archives of our diocese is this instrument that was used by Bishop Hendrick and himself on November 28th in 1878. And this was used by him to lay the cornerstone of the Cathedral of Saints Peter and Paul. When he would have used this, it would have been four years into his uh, office as bishop, into his term as bishop with us. And so he laid this cornerstone with great, great hopes and great efforts and great sacrifices on the part of all the people of the diocese. But imagine the joy when he held this and, and laid that cornerstone and, and really set out on a course that would really bless our whole diocese, even today in, in the new millennium. Uh, this building remains a great source of strength for us the place where the bishop's cathedra and chair is. One of the most um, glorious and paradoxical moments as we find in Christianity so many times and in our own lives was that Hendrik and Nor never saw the cathedral actually finished. He was supposed to consecrate the cathedral at the end um, of really around 1886. And just before it was to be consecrated in a short time, he's his asthma. He, went, he visited Holy Name Church in Providence and caught a terrible cold and it took over his asthma and became very very serious. And he was on his deathbed for about 10 days in the cathedral residence which he also had built on Fenner Street and in the end he died um, and the last words on his lips were thy will be done. Now, that's been recorded that he was there with Bishop Stang, his friend and some other priests and the, the household staff of the cathedral and the architect and other friends were gathered around him as well as the sisters that served at the cathedral and they know that he just he said to God thy will be done and he went home to God and so ironically and beautifully the first mass celebrated in the cathedral of Saints Peter and Paul was his funeral mass um, which was an extraordinary event but the point being that he never saw his work finished but those last words that he said thy will be done really really inspires Christians everywhere I think to live for the next life to go home to God uh, and Bishop Hendrickson had that freedom the freedom to believe in eternal life and literally the, the monument to Christ that he built uh, in Providence. How appropriate that we're preparing for this great celebration to remind ourselves of how we're supposed to live and imitate his yes to Christ. Even with all our buildings and administration, it's a great call for priests and laity to work together, but also to be inspired by this man's humility before whatever God's will is before his own. And so we couldn't, couldn't think of a better way for him to end his life than those, those four words, thy will be done. One of the things that's striking about Bishop Henriken is that in his death revealed what his work was in life as a priest and bishop and as a Catholic uh, because he was, had a great devotion to the poor as we're mandated to do in the gospel. And Bishop Henriken, remember, lived in an, in an anti-Catholic environment. And it's hard for us to imagine this people today against the teachings of the church, but it was, it was a very different period in, in the church's life in really a, a Puritan and Protestant country where subcultures really engulfed the public culture. So Catholic culture was deeply suspicious with foreign powers and the Pope. And, but Bishop Hendrickson uh, used the mandate of the gospel, I think, uh, to have his preferential option for the poor. He led by example. Uh, he would be on the church steps at Fenner Street, which is located right near the cathedral, his residence. And when he was in town at noontime, he would give soup out to the poor himself. He would feed the people regardless of race or ethnicity or anything and he was known really as a father of feeding the people. And I think that's why that at his funeral mass in his wake that 30,000 people would come and you would find that there's even descriptions of people without shoes uh, at the wake and they let them in uh, to view his body. I remember people, there was no public transportation, no cars, uh, a lot less people and 30,000 people um, came to view his body that was on display. They had what's called the death watch all day and night, people standing guard and praying uh, for his soul.
when they came to view his body, there was the, the, the royalty of the day, the, the people, the greatest, if you will, the, the statesmen and the large businessmen of the time, but there were also very poor people and homeless people uh, in line with all mixed together uh, to come and to honor him and to pray for him. So I think uh, his, his legacy, if you will, was that he reached out to every person. This is actually the ladle that he used. Again, he would stand on the steps of his residence at 30 Fenner Street, which still feeds people today at lunchtime on occasion. But he would, uh, he would stand on the steps and use this ladle to feed the poor. And it sounds like a, such a, a simple thing, but I think it was profound in so many ways. The Catholic bishop in a hostile environment to Catholicism, simply feeding the people. So I think it helped uh, build bridges and to witness to the gospel and to the real Catholic faith. Bishop Henrikin had so many accomplishments, uh, far too many to mention during his tenure in his 14 years as Bishop of Providence. Obviously the completion almost of the cathedral, but also 25 parishes were opened. Uh, the, he invited the Jesuits, the Religious Sisters of Jesus and Mary, uh, the Sisters of Mercy increased, uh, the, the Ladies of the Sacred Heart, all kinds of religious came in, the number of priests doubled, and 25 new parishes opened. I believe the first uh, parish that was opened was St. Joseph's in Ashton, was actually the first uh, parish that opened while he was bishop and the last one just before his death or really two months before was St. Thomas in Providence was the last parish that he uh, he really uh, founded as bishop so tremendous influences uh, tremendous social programs uh, Bishop Hendrickin was a visionary he worked he had to work with non-catholics very closely because there was so much suspicion and discrimination against the church but he was able to break that by his humility by his intelligence uh, by his service and his example uh, he really entered into great relationship. One of his best friends was the mayor of Providence at the time who died just three days before his death. Um, and many of the papers and the stories of that time talk about their friendship. Uh, he was invited to serve on the Providence School Board. He was also helping public schools open as well as opening a slew of Catholic schools and orphanages and things. So just an, an incredible person for the state of Rhode Island as well as the Diocese of Providence. So he was a very, very gifted administrator. Um, he was gifted for rhetoric. He was a teacher. He loved teaching. He would actually teach himself uh, in some of the schools and places that he visited. So he's really just, just selfless and, and a visionary, I think, a visionary for things, including the cathedral, which was his biggest legacy uh, monumentally, but um, obviously the faith of the people. Um, and the founding of the Providence Visitor on newspaper was under his time as bishop as well. He felt the call to communicate to the people and to make the church's opinion known in a very hostile environment. So he was actually able to use the media very well, which also helped him to raise funds and to uh, catechize the people and to break down barriers and walls and discriminatory opinions about Catholics in our area. <laughs>
and has been temporarily put at St. Anne's Cemetery in Cranston in the mausoleum. And on December 8th at noontime, his body will come back, escorted back to the cathedral. And you're invited to come to that. It's open to the public. And I certainly hope uh, as many people from our Dawson family can come and be there and to look back so that we can look forward. Uh, it's a great moment. Uh, it's going to be a very sacred, a very powerful moment, and a moment that I think will enable us to celebrate the dogma, the Immaculate Conception, in a real profound way. Please join Bishop Tobin on December 8th, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, at the Cathedral of Saints Peter and Paul, 12 noon, for the reinterment Mass of Bishop Hendrickin. This spot in the cathedral was chosen for Bishop Hendrickin's sarcophagus because of the stained glass window that it sits under. The stained glass window depicts Jesus washing the feet of his disciples and as a bishop, he is the servant of all the people, and this would be the appropriate spot for the sarcophagus of the first bishop of Providence. A sarcophagus is made of stone, and it holds the remains of the body and or a coffin. The sarcophagus was go, date back to 350 B.C., uh, and it's a Greek word meaning flesh eater. The Egyptians would wrap their loved ones in tape, mummify them, and then place them in the sarcophagus. Many times they would put them in another box, a casket as we know it today, and place that in a, the sarcophagus. The difference between a sarcophagus and a crypt is a crypt has no identity to the individual. A sarcophagus identifies who the individual is. If you go to the Vatican, you'll see uh, saints and popes that are buried in a sarcophagus and they depict the saints or popes lifestyle. This sarcophagus here uh, for Bishop Hendrickin is made strictly for him. It has his emblem on the front, his name, and so no one else would ever be buried in there because it's unique just to him. The granite came from Brazil. We searched throughout New England and the United States to find a granite that would uh, best match the marble on the wall. It's a Candias green granite, again from Brazil, and uh, it weighs approximately 2,100 pounds. I designed the, the sarcophagus, and I chose this design because Bishop Hendrickin was a very simple individual. And so I just had a beveled top with his crest in the center, and a, a plain f a front to the sarcophagus. Once again, Bishop Tobin believed that Bishop Hendrickin, being the first bishop of Providence, should have access from the people of the diocese here in the cathedral. Many first bishops of the dioceses throughout the United States are buried uh, in their cathedral. In honor of the reinterment of Bishop Hendrickin into the upstairs of the cathedral in a sarcophagus, the namesake school of his, Bishop Hendrickin High School in Warwick, commissioned a piece of art, an artwork that's very, very unique. It's called an illuminated manuscript. And you might be familiar with in the Middle Ages, if you see sometimes in the museums, they have um, manuscripts where, where monks particularly painted with powdered gold and powdered, uh, they powdered gold paint and they, they prayed and they would come with some kind of image of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, or one of the saints, or the gospel, particularly in the gospels, uh, when there weren't printing presses, one of the revered means of art was illuminated manuscript. It's a very rare art form today. Very few people can do it. Uh, there's a man by the name of Jed Gibbons in Chicago, Illinois, who the school commissioned in honor of this mass and of this transferal uh, to tell the story of Bishop Hendrickin's life in the art form of illuminated manuscript. So if you take a look at the manuscript, it's very, very beautiful. It's one of a kind, the only kind that's been commissioned, again, for this purpose, for this time in, in the life of our diocese and of our school community in his name. But if you look closely, Bishop Hendrickin is holding the Cathedral of the Diocese of Providence, again, which he never saw its completion, but he works so tirelessly. Uh, if you look behind him, there's a map of Ireland indicating where he came from as an immigrant and as a missionary to us. There's a ship in the back indicating that incident at sea where he was willing to really suffer literally and physically for the faith and to bring the grace of the sacraments to that dying woman in steerage. If you look around the border of the manuscript, you see that Celtic uh, imaging that goes on that represents, again, that Irish spirituality. 
If you look, there's the symbols of his office to the right. There's a mitre and crozier symbolizing his office as bishop. In the lower left-hand corner, we find from that incident at sea what he would have used to give the sacrament of the sick or viaticum to the dying woman. You see the picks with the oil, this breviary or prayer book, a similar book to this one that he would have had with him, and also the stole that is the symbol of the office of the priest when Father Hendrickin did that. Around the borders of the manuscript, you find three pearls, and the pearls represent the pearls of wisdom. Again, his motto being, wisdom is better than all things. And that comes from the story in Matthew's Gospel. The one who finds the great pearl uh, gets everything and sells everything to have that, that wisdom, that pearl, as Hendrickin did in his life. Then the pearls are sitting on a symbol of the Trinity, a heart made into the triangular, representing the three persons, but one God. There's also a, a hidden shamrock up on the left inside the Celtic border, which makes things a little fun to try to figure that out. But it's, it's a very beautiful thing. It's, it, was, it was born from prayer by Jed Givens. He took all the things we sent him about Bishop Thomas Hendrickin's life and his life as a missionary and a priest, and then he used the powdered gold to paint this image. Again, that's, that's very particular and, and a one of its kind. So it'll be featured at this upcoming Mass for the reinterment. It'll be actually the cover of the Mass booklet and an explanation on the souvenir booklet on the inside. Um, you'd be welcome to look at that or even go on them. I'm sure and we'll have it on the Dawson website soon to be able to look at that and see it for yourself. It's quite an extraordinary work. Please join Bishop Tobin on December 8th, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, at the Cathedral of Saints Peter and Paul, 12 noon, for the reinternment Mass of Bishop Hendrickin.